Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name's Ashley and I'm a soil scientist on this channel. I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about the terra preta soils or preta, however you pronounce it. Literally everyone pronounces it differently. I'm gonna say preta, we're good to go. Anyways, we're gonna be applying science to why these soils are so valuable and some of the theories as to how they got there. Maybe some theories you have never heard about but our theories nonetheless let's jump right into it so i think the best place to start with this is explaining amazon soil as a whole outside of the terra preta areas amazon forest soil is dead it is dead and it is old and what i mean by that is the age of the soil when we're looking at it from a soil scientist perspective is looking at the last time that soil had been covered by something anything and so when we look at north america and we're looking at age of soil we're typically referencing the glacial activity on that land so that could be the physical glacier being placed on the surface of that land or it could be the river a glacial river glacial fluvial deposit technically okay, that was way too nerdy um so it could be the river off the glacier or it could be glacial lacustrian another nerd term there which would be a lake bed of an old glacial lake so those are kind of your three main ones there's a ton of other ones but the three main ones and so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the age of the soil so if we look at north america obviously the direction the glaciers went in was this way so up into canada and when this happened we had different stages that the land was relieved of the glacier itself and then over time the lakes would evaporate and then that land would be released as well so when we look at a map, it's not quite a line where the glacier just progressed north or up a mountain. It's actually blotchy. And when we look at the age of the soil, so there's an old lake or an inland sea, for example, that soil is gonna be a bit newer, younger than maybe a glacial till. But for the most part, we can look at it as a line. And so let's look at it in that way here today so the amazon soil obviously i could do literally a whole video on glacial soils and development unit i could do a whole video on that so let me know if you want that so when we look at the amazon soil it is considered dead and it is considered well not dead but it's considered old and when you get an old soil you need a lot of inputs to keep that soil up and this is what upsets a lot of climate people plant people soil science people when we're talking about amazon deforestation if you're deforesting the amazon for lumber or whatever the case is and you're replanting the plants or the trees we don't really care that's fine i mean some people will but for the most part whatever as long as the plants are going back into place in the density needed to be able to keep that nice, beautiful cycle going. However, the issue is that when we clear cut these soils for cattle or for farming, we end up with a system where we're taking more than we're adding. And unfortunately in a rainforest system, there is such a balance of input and output that if you disrupt that in any way, shape or form, and this includes if you deforest and replant, but you don't replant enough, you end up with maybe two to three good years out of that soil because that soil has zero nutrient reserve. And that is where terra preta, terra preta soil comes in. So terra preta soil was noticed in the Amazon, throughout the Amazon, as a soil that was able to A, retain moisture and B, retain cation exchange capacity, AKA nutrients, AKA EC. I mean, it has a, a ton of different names. And so I've spoken about biochar before, I just, I've spoken about charcoal before, and I've noted that the water holding capacity and the nutrient holding capacity in a newer soil, such as one here in Canada or Northern US, in high quantities, if that is applied, it's almost too much. It can become toxic, but in a soil such as the Amazon, it's a beautiful thing because you never hit a toxic level in those soils because those soils are so depleted and such a, have such a low cation exchange capacity naturally 
they had a really hard time holding on to any nutrients whatsoever. So Terra Preta isn't charcoal. It is actually specifically biochar. And so for biochar to be made, it has to be burnt as organic material burnt in the absence of oxygen. So that's very, very specific conditions under which it could be made. So that does not mean this is Amazonian natives, Mayan, going out and having a big bonfire. This is very specific stuff. But once this product is added to the soil, it immediately increases that cation exchange capacity, meaning when these heavy rains come through the Amazon, the nutrients isn't so quickly washed away and the water holding capacity actually goes up enormously regardless of the volume of biomass on top of that soil surface. So this is where I'm gonna spice things up a bit, maybe with a different concept than what most have presented. And my concepts are based off of scientific literature and journals that I've read, not so much mainstream hoopla per se. So the idea of the Terra Preta soils has a lot of theory and not a lot of fact. <laughs> and I'm gonna get into why that is, but just keep that in mind. What's said about them and what's actually known about them are two very different things. So the first thing being, there's no denying the fact that biochar mixed into this really sandy old degraded soil surface is valuable. There's no arguing that. No soil scientist on the face of this planet is going to argue that terra preta soils are better than the surrounding Amazon soils. That's just a fact. However, there are some discrepancies in where terra preta soil is found. So when I say that, I mean terra preta soil has been found in sites that have been excavated where there are man-made objects and there are signs of human activity and community. So that soil would indicate that potentially it is man-made, meaning that terra preta soil was put there to help support the community of people that supplied those man-made objects. The second option is that there is no man-made objects there and people have found just terra preta soil in the absence of man-made objects, meaning how and why did we end up with terra preta soil in the middle of the Amazon without any human interference? So the first uh, theory as to why there would be areas without man-made objects and with man-made objects is that forest fires would most likely rip through the Amazon. This would leave a very clear path in an otherwise very dense forest that would then allow for these individuals to move freely in a naturally cleared landscape. And when they moved into a naturally cleared landscape, they formulated homes and they eventually grew gardens and crops. They realized that the soil in these cleared or these forest fire cleared landscapes was very valuable because it produced more food than the surrounding soils. So the first theory is that the humans moved into the areas that the forest fire was had. You're probably thinking, well, Ashley, you said they can't just have a bonfire and make this stuff, and they can't. Forest fires are much different than a campfire. So we learned this actually in our forest soils class. The charcoal left behind after a forest fire is much different than that of even a grass fire. The charcoal is a biochar after a forest fire because forest fires burn so hot and so fast that they actually eat up a lot of the oxygen in the area. It's to the point that when a forest fire is going, it's not uncommon for it to suck oxygen in from the atmosphere around it and cause a wind, an actual gust, a sucking wind into the fire and almost cause like its own little mini uh, windstorm of sorts. And I discussed this actually in my forest fire video, but it'll suck in oxygen from the atmosphere around it. And sometimes this can be very, very strong stuff. And so in or near the soil surface, 
a lot of that burnt organic material is burning in the absence of oxygen. That makes it biochar, regardless of human activity. So the next theory, um, the thing that kind of debunks it or you know spices it up a bit and makes us reconsider human activity is that the biochar in that area is where there's man-made objects is three meters very specific three meters and incredibly uniform and so anyone who's dug a soil profile in an old forest fire landscape you know that it's not even and it's not evenly spread at three meters so that in and of itself is very odd so my personal experience with digging soils in the, the boreal forest not the amazon given is that the soil profile usually after after a forest fire or even 100 years after a forest fire you can find charcoal you know 100 years after i've dug up very old forest fires before and you'll notice that there will be a burnt layer of organic material and then the actual uh, burnt material underground in the physical soil profile, for the most part, is roots. So big honking roots, and you'll see kind of these black fissures going through the soil profile, burning out the root biomass. And so that's what it typically looks like. But when I look at the terra preta soils, given I've never seen a root system of a rainforest soil up close. The most I can see is photos, and I mean, that will only tell you so much. It is very uniform, um, and it's not, doesn't look like a natural forest fire formation. It's not stringy little fissure type things. It's, it is very uniform. It's exactly three meters. So to say, with a hundred percent fact like now these people are just moving on this land after the forest fire comes through is kind of ignorant because anyone who's dug soil profiles in a forest that has been burnt it doesn't look like that that is different in its profile now maybe maybe the plants that grow in a rainforest have a much different root system than that of a boreal forest which is entirely possible and they have more of a fibrous root system with a lot of root hairs and a lot of um, Y's and apical meristem uh, splitting. And so that's what causes that nice uniform look. However, I doubt it because my understanding in an Amazon rainforest is that a lot of roots are actually kind of on the surface and it's a battle for water because the water goes through the system so fast. So it would be not advantageous to have you know a bunch of root biomass three meters down into the soil profile because once it's in it's gone uh, so the typical and that in the rainy season you wouldn't want roots in the soil system because you would have rotting so it makes me think that a majority of the roots would be on the surface which doesn't support the theory so i think the really common issue with the terra preta soil which are undeniably valuable and undeniably helped these communities in the Amazon farm and live and, and gain these big communities. A common issue is that people will make the blanket statement of biochar being mixed into the first three meters of any soil is going to be beneficial. And I'm gonna say it right now, that statement is not true. Soil is underestimated as this very simple entity but in reality it's kind of its own ecosystem and it's not the same from even one side of a field to the other soil is so complicated that if you apply three meters of biochar to any soil you are going to end up with a whole lot of different results ranging from a lot of dead plants to really high yield. And the reason for that is because subtle changes in even the parent material will change how biochar interacts with that soil. Even, even things such as past history, um, the management, the plants that have been grown on it, the environment, how much rain it gets, 
are all gonna affect whether or not biochar is useful in your garden or in the ecosystem that you are developing. I can say for a majority of people that fall into the Great Plains area who have a clay soil or a clay loam or a loamy soil, you probably don't wanna do three meters of biochar. It's gonna end badly. However, if you were gardening in the Northern Saskatchewan boreal forest where you have very sandy soils, or if you were in Asquith, Saskatchewan, I'm just throwing out names of places I know have really sandy soils, or if you were out um, by Dakota Dunes First Nation here in Saskatoon, those areas are very sandy, and so you would benefit from the addition of a biochar to that soil. You're gonna see benefits in nutrient retention, water retention, you name it. And I think the way that I can drive the point home that terra preta soils are not uniform, they're not even the same within the Amazon itself, is that when soil scientists are discussing this topic, it's not often that we would say terra preta soil, because even within the Amazon, the terra preta soils are different from one another. Each one has different attributes. Some are valuable in producing food, while others are not working as well. And so we refer to them as soils, meaning there's different versions of it. And just because you add biochar to a soil does not make it suddenly a terra preta soil. It is a terra preta soils. It falls into the blanket definition of a terra preta soil, but it's not, um, it doesn't suddenly just make it into that because there are inherent genetic coding for lack of a better term, DNA hardwired into soil that uh, ultimately you cannot change. And that's just the long and short of it. Even in the garden, I get you guys ask questions about how do I change this? How do I fix that? How do I, and in a lot of cases, if you're working with a large land mass, there's not much you can do. You can management and treat it differently, but fixing it isn't possible. That is your parent material. That is the card you were dealt. Your only option is to do a raised bed and bring soil in. If you want to change it, absolutely you can. But when we're dealing with farmers even, farmers know how dynamic soil can be. They use things such as prescription uh, fertilized mapping now, and they base that off of the yields harvested from the year before. It gives us lots of feedback as to what the soil may or may not be lacking. And even when we test for soil in a field, we don't just go to the middle of the field and, well, there's the soil test. We test on a grid. Depending on how much money you wanna spend, we'll test on a major grid <laughs> through the entire field. And that's gonna tell us the soils within that area and give us a map of the soils in that area. So that it's all very, very different. You can, depending on the discussion you're having, you can talk about soils on a very large scale. So you can talk about uh, brown, dark brown, black soils. Like when we're referring to Canada, we can talk about soil colors. We can talk about uh, parent material soils. So we have trinizemic soils, rhizolic soils. So those are all different types on that side too, all of which would fall into different categories in the dark brown, brown, black. And you can even break it down even farther from that. Like if you're in a glacial till soil, you can have within just one field, different types of soils just in five feet of each other. So it's not that simple, unfortunately. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know some of you have definitely requested it. You cannot just make a terra preta soil out of your back pocket. That would be impossible. And in a lot of cases, it's uh, not worth it because you can cause more harm than good. And um, I don't know how the heck you're gonna make biochar on a mass level unless you burn a whole forest down. That would be very tough to do. I've seen methods where it's like a slow burn underground. It's kind of like my understanding. Anyways. Besides the point, if you are in Canada, North America, if you have a loamy soil, a clay soil, and anywhere in the world, regardless of where you are, just skip the, the terra preta. 
you're, you will regret it the moment it happens. If you're in a sandy soil though, go crazy. You'll see tons of benefits to it. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Be sure to give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments down below if you've made some form of terra preta soil um, and what you think of it. And I will talk to you guys later. Bye.